Gaffney, South Carolina. It's the seat of Cherokee County, an area that is home to several ghostly legends and sightings. People have seen things they couldn't understand. County historian and award-winning author Dr. Bob Moss says there were some ghosts in the area that he has seen firsthand. At first when I told her that I'd seen a ghost, I didn't believe it. But the more I studied it, the more I realized that it could be true that such things do exist. They are spirits all around us. He's spent a lifetime collecting local stories and has a particular fondness for the paranormal kind. I like ghost stories because they are real history. And it's in the pages of history where we begin looking at the ghosts of Gaffney. Some say this small southern town is haunted by a memory of brutal violence. The stigma of being home to two serial killings set decades apart. It definitely is a ghost. It's a great big ghost that hangs over Gaffney. You know, we, we've, uh, we don't always have to live with it and, and deal with it. Uh, I can go places uh, even now and I say I'm from Gaffney and they know two or three things about Gaffney. They know that's the peach tank out on the highway and this is where that strangler was back in the 60s if they're old enough. So well, it's definitely our ghost. It's uh, the whole, that's a package ghost, but we, we, it's all together. While the man who went down in history as the Gaffney Strangler is nothing but a dreadful memory for most, there are others who point to landmarks where the cries and screams of the Strangler's victims still echo in the darkness. To get the full story, we're traveling back in time to a Thursday morning in February of 1968 when one phone call forever altered this community. Ryan Hart, but Miss Paris were the three he gave, and he gave detailed directions on where to find their bodies. And he said, Go get the sheriff, don't go by yourself. Go get the sheriff and check these places out. Just go down there and take a look. Take the sheriff with you, don't go by yourself. Oh, all right, I'll do that. Take the sheriff. Of course, he thought it was a joke, and I had stepped across the street to, uh, to have lunch. When I came back, he had called the sheriff, and they had gone to the bridge down on Ford Road. At the first sight, the body was easy to spot. They got down there and looked over the left side of the bridge, and they saw the lady down there. So then Bill stopped and called me. Nancy Paris's lifeless body was naked on the creek bank. Her head was underwater. A distinct ligature mark was visible on her neck, where her killer had choked the life out of her. An autopsy would later show the 20-year-old housewife had been raped while alive and afterwards. I guess it wasn't a hoax after all. Yeah, real problems down. Yeah, hold on a minute. So then Bill stopped and called me. and Tommy. He said, Tommy, uh, get your camera and, and meet me up. It, it was a lover's lane up there. And he said, uh, there was a body down here. A body? And he said, I got to, I got to call. And the caller told me to take out three sheets of paper and put a name at the top of each one of them. And then he gave me directions and told me to go get the sheriff and go to check it out. 
and that's what the caller had told Bill. Bill just relayed that to me, said he's going to need my help with the camera up at the second site. All right. All right, I'll be there in a second. We fanned out with about four deputies about five yards apart. Went down through the woods trying to find the body. And uh, I know I remember thinking, shoot, they, he could be still out here just waiting to pick us off because we were just far enough apart where you couldn't really see uh, you know, as much as you wanted to. And I was getting a little eerie feeling as we got deeper in the woods. And, uh, Finally, one of the deputies said, here she is, and she was covered up with some brush. We, we assisted in bringing the body out of the woods, and uh, we were basically part of the investi investigation team at that point. And then uh, the other site was actually in Union County. Uh, a lady he had, caught, he had killed some months earlier, and her husband was had already been convicted and was serving time in Union County for for killing her and come to find out he didn't kill her. And later on, they let him out. Tommy Martin is currently the publisher and editor of the Cherokee Chronicle. Back in 1968, he was a young reporter for Gaffney's other newspaper, the Gaffney Ledger. That Thursday morning when this broke, of course, we just had a three-person staff. So we uh, we all got busy. We were, for the next 10 days, we were a very busy night and day tracking all the events as they occurred and, and the murders as they occurred. Tommy is one of two surviving locals who played a role in the Gaffney Strangler investigation. I did about anything. Hung out at the Sheriff's Department all the time, night and day, and fought her leads, tried to help them coordinate leads that came in. He's also the author of the book, I Will Kill Again. In it, Tommy recounts his first big story as a journalist. You don't get that opportunity very often to do those things in your hometown. You know, some reporters go from situation to situation, but to, to be able to do it and it come to you, that was, uh, that was quite different. I had not been in the newspaper business very long. I'd done a little writing, in, you know, in college and in high school, and. I thought maybe this was normal or something. I didn't. I didn't really know. But 45 years, 47 years later, I, I've decided this wasn't very normal. It was just I was in the wrong place at the wrong time, or the right place at the right time, depending on your, your outlook of it. Tommy Martin says he was just learning the ropes as a reporter when he found himself jumping into the role of investigator in a serial murder investigation. I had gone to work with the Gaffney Ledger in 1965 after I got out of college and, uh, and this happened in uh, early 68. I was just a basically a cub reporter and a photographer and made up pages and swept the floors and about anything they wanted me to do. And, you know, I, I was so involved in, in the case and helping and I was young and energetic and uh, I had a lot of contacts and knew everybody in the sheriff's department and uh, I was really involved in it to the point I didn't sleep very much either for 10 days uh, and then kind of collapsed after it was all over. But Such a partnership between law enforcement and the media would not happen today, but Tommy says the newspaper was a major help for the sheriff's office in 1968. The sheriff's department didn't even have a camera. We took all their pictures for them and, and uh, of course we did Put, put most of the pictures we couldn't put in the newspaper. And a lot of the information we couldn't put in the newspaper because the Strangler kept calling back. You got a flood coming up from Columbia. I even got a phone call from the FBI. It's like, you know, we're going to find this guy. I just never want to hear that voice on my phone again. I can't even leave my house. Every time I walk outside, the neighbors give me these looks. How am I supposed to take being looked at like that? I believe you, Bill. I know you didn't. People, they're going to talk. People around town are starting to say, hey, you get the phone calls, maybe that's made up. You know, they're beginning to think it's you. So we got to find this guy and find him fast and put all these stupid rumors to rest. Hello, this is Bill. Hello, Mr. Gibbon. It's me again. It's you again. We're going to have to do something about that man down there in Union County serving my sentence. 
I told y'all, y'all arrested the wrong man. Me killed that dead man woman. Second time he called, he, he called. He probably figured that the, the, the phones at the ledger were bugged, which they were. The, you know, FBI came in and SLED came in mostly. FBI came in a little later, but SLED came in and, and, and they tapped the phones at the ledger. So he was smart enough, clever enough, that he called uh, Mr. Gibbons at home. Uh, with his wife and children there, and and it so happens that one of the agents was at, at Bill's house with him and got on the extension, and at that time, uh, the strangler told him where the effects were, some green stamps, car keys, some other things that were in Miss Deadman's pocketbook. They were on a separate road altogether in a different part of the county. Tommy says the strangler gave Gibbons a warning to pass along to investigators. What do you want with me? You tell the sheriff his boys better catch me real soon or I'm gonna take me another one. Why don't you just turn yourself in? Nah, y'all gonna have to hunt me down and shoot me dead like the dog I am. Hello? He don't know. Bill told him, so why don't you just turn yourself in? And he said, no, so they're gonna have to shoot me down like the dog I am. and. Uh, of course, we were asked not to print any of that. We didn't print any of it. We were scared to death. I had a sister living by herself. And uh, of course, another thing that he told Bill that we couldn't print is all the fat ones and ugly ones didn't have to worry. He wasn't gonna kill a fat one or an ugly one. So I told my sister she was safe and we laughed about that, but she. <laughs> the next morning, five days into the investigation, the strangler, made good on his threat. The strangler abducted 14-year-old Opal Buxton as she waited at her bus stop. Her sister always walked with her, but had been late leaving home that morning. She arrived just in time to see a strange man stuffing Opal into the trunk of his 1957 Chevy, then speeding away. Within hours, the most massive manhunt ever to take place in South Carolina at the time was underway the already tense and terrified community was in a frenzy. It was a very scary time. People didn't get information as quickly as they wanted it. The national news didn't come until they found the fourth body. The community demanded updates, forcing the Gaffney Ledger to print extra editions. We put out uh, an extra one time. We printed on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We even put out an extra edition, the first in the 110 year history of the newspaper. Or well, one time, and they just backed up at the door to buy them. They were a dime a piece and had a lot of dimes. <laughs> when the FBI joined the case, agents re examined the evidence and paid close attention to the method the killer used to choke the life out of his victims. You know, he killed these, these four ladies with a belt. You know, they didn't use a gun, he didn't use a knife, he didn't, you know, he. He took off his belt, strangled these four people. Federal investigators began looking for a connection between the way the killer strangled his victims and a number of knots it appeared the killer had tied out of bits of string. But they were at the scene of the crime. Dr. Bob Moss, who was a professor at Limestone College at the time, also had some expertise in this area, and the FBI came seeking his advice. When the FBI came to me, all I could tell them was that it had to be a man that was in the textile industry, but who it was, I did not know. But the method of the choking and the knots that was tied, it had to be a man that had some knowledge and worked in the textile industry to tie those knots. That posed a problem, since textile mills were the main employers in the area, providing jobs for thousands of people. Ultimately, it was the reports that Opal Buxton's abductor had driven off in a black 57 Chevrolet that led to a break in the case. We uh, got a good break when we, when we caught him and the two guys chased his car and, and Sled did a good job of tracking him down from there. A group of concerned citizens chased down a man named Leroy Martin from a place near the Cowpens Battlefield National Park. They saw his 57 Chevy halfway hidden down an unused dirt road and when he saw them, they say Martin took off. Investigators combed the area where Martin's car had been seen, but found nothing. 
but they had a suspect who drove a 57 Chevy they could start looking into. Meanwhile, investigators continued to look for evidence that linked Leroy Martin to the crimes, because by all outward appearances, he seemed like an average Joe. Leroy Martin was a nice looking, regular looking guy, and he, uh, he was nice, uh, nice enough looking to have you know, gotten girls had he been so persuaded, but he was married and had children and uh, had always kept a steady job. Days later, investigators went back to the area where Martin had been seen loitering in the woods. And after an exhaustive search, they found Opal Buxton's body buried in a shallow grave. Leroy Martin was arrested at Musgrove Mill where he worked that very afternoon. His friends and co-workers were aghast. He was just one of the guys sitting next to you at the diner drinking coffee and reading the paper and saying, I wish they'd catch that SOB. And uh, after the fact, you know, when he was arrested, there was a few things that came out about uh, his past and, and some incidences that supposedly he was involved in. But at that time, no, he wasn't. He was just like everybody else. There were so, several ladies at the mill where he worked that were so scared at the time the strangler was going on, the 10 days before he was caught, that he volunteered to walk them into the mill each night from, uh, from their car in the parking lot at night, you know, on third shift or second shift or whatever. And then when they found out, when they came in the mill and actually arrested them, I think one of them fainted and, and a couple of others were, uh, were just, everybody was pretty much amazed. You know, when somebody's doing those kind of things and killing these, these young girls and uh, telling you they're gonna kill again, you, you can, you see all these faces in your mind and, and, and none of them are very pleasant. And then when you actually see the guy who did it, and it, it's, it's not exactly what you expected. While the community had its doubts, the FBI found more knots tied near Opal Buxton's body and again turned to historian Bob Moss for guidance. Well, when a man gets nervous, he's got a piece of cord in his hand, he will start tying knots in it if he's under pressure. And so the FBI found these knots and they asked me about them. I said, give them back to him and under pressure you'll see him tie the same knots, and he did. Dr. Moss and the FBI found this to be compelling proof that Leroy Martin was indeed the Gaffney Strangler. There was evidence that said he was there. Tommy Martin, who is of no relation to Leroy, said he had seen some things during his own investigation that convinced him authorities had nabbed the right man, too. But I, I had been riding by there uh, in front of his house for a couple of days before they actually arrested him, and I saw the the car, I saw him out there washing his car one time. I saw the little handprints on the back windows and, 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 and that kind of stuff. And it was, it was all kind of spooky. Leroy Martin initially confessed to the crimes. Martin changed his tune in court and pleaded not guilty during his three separate murder trials. But he was found guilty in each one and sentenced to three life sentences in prison. He was killed by another inmate in 1972. I think he, in his own way he wanted to be called. I think, you know, that he, he was a uh, schizophrenic. He, he later told him it, he was like standing on the side of a mountain watching himself do these things down in the valley, but he couldn't stop himself. And he was a split personality. And I think part of him wanted to be called. I think another part of him enjoyed the publicity. He would get up every morning and go down to a local cafe and and get copies of all the papers and read and talk about the strangler and that guy must be crazy and all that kind of stuff. 45 years have now passed since Leroy Martin's murder spree. But the terrifying memory of those crimes are still alive. This thing just doesn't never die. I mean, we're still selling the little book that I wrote. We sell, as not a week goes by, it's been 45 years this year since, it, since that's happened in 68. Just this year, the FBI declassified the Strangler case, unearthing many new details Tommy Martin is reluctant to share with the community. I got a hold of a new transcript just this year, uh, his actual interview with the FBI. It, it didn't surface until this year. And uh, 
we, we've, we've got hold of it. It was about 50 pages of question and answers, and he pretty much tells the whole story. Of course, we hadn't gone into that and, and don't plan to, but it's not ever going away. Some also say the spirits of the Strangler's victims are never going away. Tommy Martin says he's heard a number of ghost stories and whispers about paranormal experiences related to the case emerge over the years. The first had to do with Leroy Martin's car. After he was caught, the, the car was sold to a friend of mine. Tommy's friend thought the car was, well, a babe magnet, since he was getting a lot of dates with young ladies who were quietly excited for the chance to ride in the Strangler's car. But the dates didn't last long because of what the women heard coming from the back of the car every time the driver pulled to a stop. He'd try to pull over and stop or whatever, and all of them said they could hear screams or moans. And, and you know, of course, the car took on kind of a life of its own, and, and a guy from Blacksburg bought it, fixed it up, spent a lot of money on it. First time he drove it, he, he ran off the road and totally lost it. So, so that kind of added to the mistake a little bit. In the four decades since the murders, other strange stories have surfaced in areas where the Strangler committed his crimes. Many are still accessible today. The bridge over People's Creek Road has become known as Leroy's Bridge for those who believe that Nancy Paris's lost soul still emerges from beneath the waters here in the night and moans in agony for anyone who will listen. While this is the confirmed location that the body was found, there are a number of other locations listed as Leroy's Bridge on the internet and other misinformation that younger generations believe about the Strangler. One such myth is that the ruins of this grist mill is a location where Opal Buxton's body was found and that her spirit haunts the site. But that's far from the truth. The local authority on the Strangler case, Tommy Martin, doesn't put much stock in any of the ghost stories. Those are just monuments, I guess, to some people. But uh, And the place where he uh, kidnapped the, the little Buxton girl out past Hamrick's, uh, is, is still there. I mean, it, that road's still there, just like it was then. They said they've heard cries off this bridge. We partnered with the local ghost hunting group Two Dead Crew to test the legends. We're over the bridge where um, the Gaffney Strangler dumped the body of Nancy Paris in 1968. I think it was February 8, 1968. We're going to try to contact Nancy. At one in the morning on Ford Road, no other vehicles or people were in sight. You hear that? Yes. More bullfrogs? Yeah. That's more bullfrogs. Nancy Paris, are you here with us tonight? Nancy, if you're here, come on up and talk to us. We've got some equipment here, some, some stuff on the bridge that if you touch it, it'll, make, it'll light up and we'll know that you're here and communicate with us. Chris and Shana asked questions to any spirits that might be lingering nearby and recorded those questions on a digital recorder. Nancy, do you know the name Leroy Martin? Is he the man who killed you? Hoping they could play it back later and hear some interaction from a spiritual presence. And we don't want to hurt you, we just want to talk. Come let us know you're here. They also had devices that monitor electromagnetic fluctuations in the surrounding atmosphere. There's no real power source out here on the bridge, so if this lights up red and the dial starts going, it's getting electromagnetic energy from somewhere. We didn't catch anything concrete, but again, you know, it was it was it was a hard night to catch anything concrete. A lot of sounds of nature right now. And as far as feelings go, I think I was just more overcome with what it actually the history of it than the present and what almost what almost an on. empathy. Yeah. yeah. But the filmmakers and the ghost hunters could not shake a creepy sensation. It's definitely creepy out here, a very overwhelming sense of dread. Initially for me, I thought somebody brought a dead body here and dumped it in the river right where we were standing, you know, four decades earlier. And that, just that history was a huge creep factor for me. I mean, big time. And the manner in which she died, you know, raped, murdered, and then dumped. Wow. Did you hear that? The crew definitely heard wailing. A chorus of bullfrogs created an eerie chant 
as Chris and Shayna investigated. Full frogs and cicadas. Yeah. Wow. In the recordings and while we were out there, there were several types of bullfrog trills, is what they're called. And there was a very high-pitched one that almost sounded feminine really? to me, like a female wailing or crying. And I thought maybe we just kind of debunked that. I don't know, but it was definitely a frog that was doing it. We're going to get close as we can down there without hurting ourselves. Chris wasn't ready to give up just yet. He ventured down to the water's edge to conduct one more recording session. Are you here, Leroy? I just thought I heard somebody walking up behind me. Leroy Martin? I felt weird when I walked down there, I, and, and I can't say it was a presence or anything. It may have just been the whole situation, you know, when you turn your flashlight and look underneath the, 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 the bridge and there's nothing but blackness. And, you know, you guys were out there. We had, what, how many cars come by? In Zero. A, none. Uh, you know, without any light, you know, I, can you imagine what she was going through? You know, even if she, I don't know if she was still alive whenever he dumped her or, but, it was black nothingness, and she was dumped it out. It was like disturbing. A, like she was a piece of garbage, yeah. Yeah, that, that facet, more than the paranormal, was more disturbing for me in that. You guys getting anything? Chris and Shayna both felt emotionally moved by the dark history they were so close to, but neither of them felt anything paranormal out there. So if there was anything out there, we weren't able to get any anything. Next, the team heads to the area where Nancy Christine Reinhardt's body was found. What was a lover's lane is now an industrial park. Tina, are you here? Reinhardt's friends nicknamed her Tina. And when the two dead crew started calling Tina's name, Shayna's EMF meter went off. Did you hear that? Right as something interfered with our audio recording. What you're about to see has not been altered. Did you hear one? Like All one. about some footsteps for me tonight. Oh. Did you get a spot? Yes, I did. Was that you walking through the grass? Come over here and touch this thing in my hand. Shortly afterwards, Haunted Echoes producer Rob Baker felt something strange. I just got like uh, chills. Put your thing in his hand. Why don't you go stand over there with him? Shane wants to take your picture. You think you can muster up enough energy to come touch this green light? He yeah. swears an outside force was acting on his body, leading him up a hill toward the undeveloped area of the park. Would it be weird for me to say that I feel like something's pulling me back? Not at all. I feel like something's wanting me to turn around. Something's pushing my... I'm not kidding. Shayna felt the pull as well. I got some feelings when we actually walked up the hill. Almost like something was drawing me up there. Is there anybody out here who wants to talk to us right now? Chris, I'm serious. It like... This way? Just like, it, for some reason. I don't know. It just... And while we don't doubt Rob's feelings were genuine, Chris isn't sure they were brought on by anything ghostly. Possibly just the, the, the raw emotion associated with the moment. I didn't get any feelings out there. Well, it's no big secret that I'm the most skeptical member of the Haunted Echoes crew. And like Chris, I thought Rob might have just been caught up in the moment and maybe let his imagination get the best of him. But uh, Shayna captured some photographic evidence that uh, made me change my tune just a little bit. She says wherever I am at and she takes photos, ghost orbs appear all around me. As uh, skeptical as our friend is here, the orbs love him. I don't know what it is, but every time I take a picture that he's in, there are enormous orbs around him. Take a look for yourself. Are these spots of light aberrations in the image or something paranormal? Shayna says there's no explanation for these orbs around me. And she's pretty good at picking out which ones are natural distortions. Theoretically, uh, they are supposed to be the energy of spirits manifested into these little spherical balls of light that seem to be generating their own light source. That's what I look for. Um, I like ones that are blurry, 
or have a tracer behind them because it shows intelligent movement in one direction or another. Uh, I, I got a great picture of a mosquito out at one of our hunts this time and I was like what is that and you got to look and you could see the legs and you could see the wings you know and and a lot of the stuff you see you've got to determine whether it's dust or whether it's something else. For some reason they they pose for me. I can have people take pictures with their cameras and nothing and I'll take the camera and start taking and there they are. So, is there, it's weird. Is there any kind of specific setting or anything? Or any kind of specific I camera? have my digital camera set for night. That's about it. And then I do use the flash. Were ghosts really following me around? Chris and Shayna found no other evidence to support that. We didn't get any uh, EVPs. No. I personally felt like it would be more active than what we found. But then again, there the bullfrogs were so loud and the cicadas were so loud who's to say that we didn't catch something we just couldn't, couldn't hear, hear it. it while the team found no conclusive evidence of hauntings at either site tommy martin says there's no shortage of interest in the strangler case and any echoes it's left behind i haven't been to those places uh, any of them in a long time i have no not really any desire to go down there and uh I'm sure people do still. I like, obviously, we you know we still sell the book, and uh, it's, it still sells. And people, I guess, will read the book and then drive down there and take a look at it, and maybe it resonates with people. Whether or not actual ghosts linger in wake of the brutal killings, different tales and legends about Leroy Martin and his victims are a frequent topic of conversation. Everybody in Cherokee County has a has a Gaffney Strangler story, has a Leroy Martin story. Everybody, and and if it's not, it's their mother, or their granddaddy, and well, he used to live next door. I went to church with him, or whatever. Many of these Strangler stories have been told again within the past four years, after another brutal killer began preying on the people of Gaffney. In the summer of 2009, another killer struck the small South Carolina town killing five people within five days, sparking once again the most massive manhunt in South Carolina history and grabbing the attention of every state law enforcement agency along with the FBI. Again for 10 days, the case sparked the same kind of terror in the community that the Strangler case had 41 years earlier. You know, it was the deja vu. I mean, everybody said, you know, this, this is unbelievable that would one little community, small little community in you know rural South Carolina would have two serial killers, and I think he was officially a, 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 a spree killer, but he did kill you know five people or whatever, and it was it, it did take a few days to catch him, and and people were everybody basically was com was comparing everybody that was old enough to remember it and some that had just heard the stories. The comparisons were obvious and the, you know, the, the feeling was obvious. The only difference was, you know, you had a hundred trucks here with, from, from all the news organizations and they were collecting data and material and stuff from all over the area and it was, uh, that part of it was a lot different. It was a scary couple of days uh, back in 2009. I was working as a photojournalist for a local news outfit and we were covering this spree killing 24 hours a day. We had people in Cherokee County. And uh, just like Tommy said, in, uh, was the case in 1968, we had people stationed outside the sheriff's office just kind of waiting for something to happen so we could be there and be on it. And uh, it was very early one morning. It's about an hour drive from my house to the Cherokee County uh, Sheriff's Office. And I was sitting there trying to fight some drowsiness and uh, just like uh, Tommy Martin uh, got in 1968, I got a little uneasy feeling uh, when I was thinking this guy who's killing random people, it seems, might get a real kick from uh, shooting this news guy who's uh, taking a nap in his news vehicle in the sheriff's, par sheriff's office parking lot. I mean, after all, he did kill two people at a store less than half a mile away from the sheriff's office. This guy was bold, and this guy had the community terrified. Yeah, it was it was kind of weird. It really was. I was glad that with the help of the police up in North Carolina, that guy got caught relatively quickly. After 10 days, deputies in North Carolina killed Patrick Burris in a gunfight 
outside of the town of Dallas. Later that day, federal and South Carolina officials confirmed Burris was the killer who had been terrorizing Gaffney. To this day, investigators still have very few details about what sparked Burris's killing spree, and so far no ghostly legends have emerged from that case. Maybe it's a little early for, for legends. You know, I don't know what the, uh, <laughs> the birth rate, you know, how many years it takes to, to, to birth a legend, but uh, those families too were all so well thought of, and not that the, not to the others weren't, but these were so uh, familiar to the community and had businesses here and uh, long-time citizens and they uh, I think the community just kind of rallied around them a little bit more and, and and stayed away from pushing things like that. Tommy says another reason the Burris case was so eerily similar to the Strangler case is because he says the town hasn't changed all that much since 1968. He thinks that's why the ghost stories continue to get passed around. And I think the, the fact that the community hasn't physically changed as much as other communities over the years, the fact that uh, like three or four of those, three or four of, of those sites are still basically the way they were, you know, 45 years ago, probably lends to that also. They can still drive down there and see the bridge and and go up and see the road where the, one of them was abducted and, uh, you know, th those things haven't changed and, and I guess if they were gone, maybe it'd be out of sight, out of mind, but, you know, I guess that, that does lend to keep it alive. And Tommy says social media is also introducing the legends to younger generations. People get to talking about it, it gets on Facebook again, uh, schools, it's been in the schools and uh, and all, whole new generations of people uh, are interested in it. Hollywood has come calling too, but so far the Strangler story hasn't been spread to the masses on the big screen. Well, there's been three different screenplays written about this, and if and when that ever comes out, now, you know, there's so much on TV now with things like that, then I think it'd probably all bubble back up again. So uh, I think it always is just bubbling under the surface, and, and there's a lot of people still old enough like myself to remember it and, uh, and, and they were, who were alive and I think it's going to be around a long time. While it may not be paranormal in nature, the case will continue to haunt the city of Gaffney. As far as Tommy Martin, the editor and publisher of the Cherokee Chronicle, he says he's had another ghost to contend with inside the building where the newspaper operates. See, this building here is supposed to be haunted. There's been two people killed in this building. You can come up here by yourself sometimes and doors are closed and the windows are raised. From everything I've seen and heard, I would say that there is definitely some activity there. Everybody that's ever worked here, uh, which is a substantial number of people, because we've been here 25 years almost, uh, feel like there is a presence here. I'm telling you, there's probably more than one person that we're dealing with right now. Holy hell. Whoa, right here. Oh, yeah. Right, the, oh. Yeah. right here. You feel that? Big time. I'm, I've got goosebumps all over right here. Are you watching this? Is that the, is that the flashlight? Dude, that's SOS. It's going doop, 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 doop. It sure it is. That's an SOS. Next week on Haunted Echoes, South Carolina, we'll share the full history and the shocking results of the ghost investigation inside the Cherokee Chronicle building.